Je ne conditionnerai pas euh, notre coopération en matière de... I will not make our cooperation in defense or economic matters conditional on these disagreements. First, because I believe in the sovereignty of people and respect for our legitimate and reciprocal interests. Second, because I believe that it is more effective to have a policy of demanding dialogue than a policy of boycott that would reduce the effectiveness of one of our partners in the fight against terrorism and for regional stability. So the clip that you just watched was French President Emmanuel Macron responding to a journalist who was asking him about his opinion or his thoughts on French arms exports and their export to Egypt, who has a somewhat spotty record on human rights. And Emmanuel Macron essentially responded to the reporter with the equivalent of, I don't give a shit. But that's not all too surprising, especially if you look at French arms transfer policy over the past 50 years. They are concerned about the export of arms to bring money back into the economy of France, not only just because it's money that they can dump back into the economy in general, but money to bring back to invest in research and development in the arms industry to keep it competitive. Now, why does that matter? Well, the explanation for that lies all the way back in 1958 when Charles de Gaulle was elected French president. Charles de Gaulle was a general and also fought in two different world wars. And the reason why I bring that up is because if we look at the decision making, especially his view of how to make France a prestigious and autonomous country, being a general and being around the military played a big part in his decision making. Because in Charles de Gaulle's mind, in 1958, the best way to secure the sovereignty of France, not only now, but in the future, was through defense autonomy. And Charles de Gaulle made short work when he got into office of developing the nuclear bomb for France. He saw a robust defense industry and new nuclear arms as the main bulwark against what was going on in Europe at the time. Remember, at that point in time, in the late 50s to early 60s, Charles de Gaulle could look around the rest of Europe and see how much influence the U.S. was actually having in domestic and foreign policies of all the other states within Europe. Charles de Gaulle didn't like that. Charles de Gaulle was a proud Frenchman. He wanted France to be an independent nation. And again, the best strategy in his mind was defense autonomy and investing a massive amount of money into an autonomous and self-sufficient defense industry. Creating a self-sufficient industry looks great. In fact, most states around the world would love to have a self-sufficient defense industry. But there's also a reason why most don't, because it takes a massive amount of money. Remember, those of us that come from the U.S. have somewhat of a, of a privileged view of this concept because we have a pretty self-sufficient defense industry who pretty much produces everything that our military could possibly need. But we're also a very large country that can afford to dump that much money into a defense industry itself. France is much smaller, right? So the problem becomes, especially when you're dealing with more high-tech defense goods, they become so expensive that you have to really two choices whenever you do create a defense industry. Either the state funds a massive amount of it, or you go looking for exports. The problem with exports, though, is the only way that you're going to be able to export arms is if anybody actually likes the arms that you're trying to export. There's a good reason why China hasn't been that successful in the export of arms until late. That's because nobody wants some cheap arms. Nobody wants something that may break down. And everybody wants the highest possible tech, the coolest stuff that they could possibly buy. So even creating an export market still takes a lot of money. So France understood that in and of itself, it couldn't forever subsidize its own defense, in, uh, its own defense industry. So it had to push for exports to get part of that money back so the state didn't go bankrupt in trying to fund its own domestic defense industries. This need for exports to fund a self-sufficient defense industry wasn't lost on the French ministers in power. In 2018, French defense minister Florence Parley was quoted as saying, arms exports are the business model of our sovereignty. 
Now, the longer quote below, yes, it's long, but trust me, it's worth it because it spells it all out for us, came from an internal memorandum from the French defense minister at the time in 1976, Michael Debray. Sorry, anybody who speaks French, if they want to chastise me for the pronunciation of that name, feel free. But he was quoted within this memo as saying, if we want a non-dependent defense policy, we are driven to maintain a significant national arms industry. But the arms industry is a cutting edge industry in which investment in R&D spending are high. If the industry were to satisfy only national needs, its prices would be prohibitive. Therefore, we must widen the markets through joint weapons development, offset agreements, and simple exports. This is the type of belief and type of policy that is still driving French military industry and arms exports today. That's why the French president can stand in front of a crowd in France with the Egyptian president who who obviously has committed a number of human rights abuses within his own country and can still defend arms transfers as merely an economic effect. And he really doesn't get any pushback. So if we look at the French defense industry now, it's a very robust industry. And France, in many ways, has been able to guarantee the type of defense autonomy that Charles de Gaulle put forth in 1958. And they've done it increasingly through the use of exports and bringing that that money back from the sales of exports back into their own defense industry to make sure that they're keeping cutting edge, not only to supply their own military, but also for their products to be competitive on the world export market. So for Charles de Gaulle, if we go all the way back, well, his goal of not being dependent on the U.S. succeeded in many different ways, especially as far as defense goes. If we look at the rest of Europe, still most of Europe is fairly dependent to a particular degree on U.S. defense. The problem, though, is is that there is a trade-off that tends to come with that. Yes, France is not dependent on any one power, but the problem is is the price of their sovereignty, especially as far as their defense industry goes, the price of that sovereignty is high, and it comes at a cost of exporting to countries and to world leaders, which are less savory than most. So that's why, essentially, the French president can stand in front of a group full of journalists and essentially say, it doesn't matter that this country commits human rights abuses. Fact is, is they have cash, and the only way that we can guarantee our sovereignty is if we keep having cash and sales flowing back into our defense industry.